Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about Global Diversity Awareness Month. And I would be remiss if I didn't also say Happy Indigenous Peoples Day today as well as World Mental Health Day. So really focusing on uh, today's theme for World, uh, World Mental Health Day, which is make mental health and well-being for, um, for all a global priority. Uh, so lots of days, lots of things to celebrate on today, um, including for the month, but um, wanted to make sure to, to mention all of those. Um, proud to be celebrating Indigenous Peoples, Peoples Day, given the fact that, you know, my family definitely are descendants of uh, Native Americans growing up in Texas, uh, that the Hana and me definitely resonates with Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, but moving on to what we wanted to talk about today is, you know, when we, even when we talk about Mental Health Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, what does it really mean in terms of observing diversity for an entire month? How do we create awareness about that? But what I wanted to go and talk about is a little bit further because lots of organizations are all talking about diversity, diversity month, and really highlighting their representation and all of these things that they're doing, but, and really managing the optics of their DEI um, activity and engagement. And that I'm really excited about all of that, happy that people are creating awareness. But how do we make sure that every organization is holding themselves accountable to go beyond this, this optical diversity? And what do we mean by that? What do we mean by, um, you know, going beyond optical diversity? And what I really mean is that when organizations, leaders really start tapping into just filling seats and having diverse representation. Diverse representation is one thing. And and I've been part of that, right? When I was heading up diversity recruiting um, at other organizations, we worked really hard to make sure that we created opportunities and brought in diverse talent. But one of the biggest pet peeves and one of the biggest failures I always felt was a couple of years after we bring in all this spectacular talent, they'd leave. They leave because they weren't really being engaged. They weren't being really utilized or tapped for all of their diversity of thought and the cognitive diversity that they brought to the organization. They would leave because they felt underutilized. They feel like they didn't belong. And the organization was losing out because they weren't really tapping into that full potential of those individuals' backgrounds and their life experiences and the 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 perspectives that they brought. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that of how do you, as an organization, how do you as a leader, as an inclusive leader, go beyond optical diversity? And how do you establish a culture of cognitive diversity and this idea of really reaping all of the benefits that diversity and inclusion can bring to the bottom line of an organization? And so if we think about a spectrum or we think about like, you know, just really kind of like a continuum going up from, you know, the X and Y axis and seeing it going up. If you think about before DEI was really something that organizations were focused on, you had a very homogenous group, right? Same gender, same ethnicity, same education, same upbringing, same industry experience, same functional experience. It was very vanilla, for lack of a better term. Um, And then, you know, you started seeing people realizing that diversity, there needed to be some diversity and diversifying, you know, their talent pool for various reasons, right? Maybe it was even check the box of, you know, EEO and federal government saying you needed to diversify organizations really focusing on women's initiatives and bringing in different talent. And you started to see some better numbers of optical diversity, right? Where organizations then become optically diverse. And the research shows that 
when you get to a point or the, the threshold is roughly 30% women, 20% mixed ethnicities, um, you can really start considering yourself or you're actually, you know, making leeway into optical diversity. But what happens is sometimes organizations stop there. Um, and the, the reality is, though, is they aren't diversifying the pipelines or they aren't really digging deep into finding true talent. Um, they're doing a lot of the status quo things. And so what happens with optical diversity is, yes, you may have 30% women, 20% mixed ethnicity, but a lot of the times, they may have the same educational backgrounds, the same upbringing, the same industry experience. Um, you know, they may have a little bit of different company experience, but there isn't as much diversity of thought or cognitive diversity in that. To really become an organization that is starting to really reap the benefits of diversity of thought and this, cogn this idea of cognitive diversity is when not only do you have 30% women, 20% mixed ethnicity, but you also starting getting, getting a mix of education. You get a mix of upbringing, socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, just growing up in different regions of just the United States or the world, whatever that may be. And also people from different industries, right? Because if you've grown up in a particular industry, you may be a little siloed or a little, you know, have blinders on and may have some blind spots. And there may be some strategies and some really great ways of um, efficiencies that other industries are using that can be brought in to your organization. And so really making sure that you are getting, you know, diversity from various different people. And so rather than concentrating on that optical diversity, teams can get the greatest gains in risk management, in innovation, in performance. And you can eliminate this idea of groupthink by building teams that have true diversity of thought. And that's what we mean by getting beyond the optical diversity. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. And so... We may say, okay, well, you know, that's great. It sounds great, but how does it really impact the bottom line? And there's been a lot of empirical research lately that has been really helping people understand the business case really behind diversity. And I hate using the, you know, the phrases that everybody's been using of business case for diversity and all of that. But to be quite honest, sometimes these leaders who we're trying to get to embrace this idea of diversity, they're not going to listen unless you can show them how it impacts that bottom line. What is that business case? How do you align your diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies to the business and that's when you start seeing some gains in people understanding like, oh, this isn't just checks the box or a nice to have. This makes business sense. And so for, for some, we're even seeing a lot of the activity happening because maybe it is a little check the box or we have now some regulations and things that are coming through in the form of ESG reporting that are kind of holding organizations you know, feet to the fire. And so recent report that came out in 2021 from Ernst & Young, they had their January 2021 report, which were insights from 300 institutional investors and really looking at their board governance and oversight um, research that, that was found some interesting things in that all of these investors are now starting to lift the hood and look under the ESG and look under the hood and really trying to understand what are companies doing around the S in ESG, which is the social, you know, responsibility. And in that social responsibility is a lot of the human and, and DEI factors. 
And so what were some of the human capital disclosures that many investors were looking at and wanting organizations to dig deeper in? Well, there were three, the trend that came out is that there were three trends that, th- that this report says is happening. And the first one, of course, is workforce diversity in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, that tops the list of the human, you know, um, the human capital disclosures that inv- investors want to see the most by far. But again, challenging them to scratch this, you know, that's just scratching the surface and challenging them to go beyond that and really getting them to understand that, you know, we have to go further than that. But most importantly, 85% of investors say they wanted increased disclosure in that area of workforce diversity, and they wanted to see beyond gender, race, and ethnicity. And the finding also aligns with diversity of the company's boards and workforce. Um, That was really kind of you know, who are you engaging? And so they're starting to ask those questions and companies are starting to kind of backpedal a little bit and realize they have a lot of work to do. The next really interesting point that lots of investors are looking for and asking their companies to report on is pay equity. That was the second highest area of interest for investors. 53% of investors generally discussed pay equity as an extension of workforce diversity disclosures. And they wanted to really get inside and understand if the company has structural issues around diversity and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and do they need to address pay gap? What is the median pay gap? And really showing how women and minorities across the organization are paid on average, regardless of their role. So a lot of these investors are starting to really hold organizations accountable. Third, that the thing that investors were wanting to see is workforce stability. That was the mo- that was the third most cho- chosen topic of interest by investors, and what really this meant is they wanted to understand turnover data. You know, wanting to understand and gain insights onto whether companies are building, um, you know, on the biggest investment that the company is making, which are their people. What are they What are they doing in terms of onboarding their diverse talent, training, upskilling those um, all of their employees, but but specifically their diverse talent? How are they helping women and my and BIPOC professionals adapt to work um, workforce changes? And really understanding that they were really wanting to dig deep and not just asking for overarching oh our diverse population, quote, quote, lumping everybody together, but they're actually wanting to, you know, disaggregate the information by gender, race, ethnicity, to really be able to enhance their view into all of the diversity challenges that might be happening, and really wanting to understand level and all of those things. So if that alone isn't, you know, enough to make a leader say, okay, I need to really start, you know, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Here are the other, some other stats. If we really want to think about, um, you know, current and future state, the 2020 U.S. Diversity Index six, it showed that 61%, the probability of two people picked at random will be from a different race, ethnicity um, in the future. And so if we look at the census data, of individuals will be diverse. And so there is no more excuse about pipeline and not having the diversity of talent um, from a gender and and, and ethnic perspective anymore for organizations. And because groups that were formerly seen as minorities are going to reach majority status by 2044. And this was from the Society of HR Management, from SHRM itself, really warning HR um, leaders that we needed to pay attention that the composition of our of, of your talent of your people is going to change. And 48% of Gen Z are considered racial or ethnic minorities. And that was from the Pew Research Center. So there's lots of data now that are like, you know, it's it's no longer just a nice to have. It's a business imperative. You have to start thinking about this. And so really thinking about, you know, um, other other research out there, do your own research, right? McKinsey released a report in 2020, Diversity Wins, and really honing in on how inclusion matters. And here is the interesting thing. For diverse companies, the likelihood of outperforming industry peers on profitability has increased over time, while the penalties are getting steeper because of a lack of diversity. 
But here is the bottom line. This is what leaders are going to really be, be excited about. Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on executive teams were 25% more likely to have above average profitability than companies in the fourth quartile. So 25% more likely to have above average profitability if you just had gender diversity. And so think about it. Diverse companies from a Deloitte report said diverse companies ha- enjoy 2.3 times higher cash flow per employee. Diverse management boosts revenue by 19%. That came out of a study from Boston Consulting Group. Another McKinsey report shared that gender diverse companies have 15% 15% more likely to beat industry median financial returns. So there's more and more empirical data showing that there is truly a business case for diversity. It's no longer this anecdotal, nice to have, you know, just, you know, quant- qualitative data. There are true numbers now showing that you will certainly benefit from a bottom line perspective if you really start going beyond this idea of optical diversity. And so the way I see it is that there's two types of leaders when it comes to going beyond optical diversity is, you know, first, which is rare um, and maybe not rare, but harder is the leader who's genuinely who truly genuinely understands the value of having a workforce or, you know, institution that comprises a wide range of demographics. These leaders believe that they have an obligation to give give up some of their power and to BIPOC professionals, to women, and have a moral and, and that those individuals have a right to gain it. They have a right to these opportunities. And beyond that, you know, foundation mor- moral motivation, they also believe that, you know, as all the studies show, that diversity leads to a healthier and more effective organization. And most importantly, this kind of leader they're not under the delusion that this is all easy and comfortable to do. They understand that in order to have a truly inclusive organization, that there is going to be a healthy dissonance. There's going to be healthy debate. There is going to be courageous, you know, uh, conversations and that, you know, changing hearts and minds and, you know, that it's, it's, it's harder than rocket science, right? That you you know, through this work, you're going to surface blind spots. You're going to shed outdated models of working that you are going to honestly be relinquishing power um, that leads to really great things and bigger returns, but it doesn't feel easy on the way there. And it's all about this growth mindset. And we all know, you know, the psychologist Carol Dweck, who really coined the idea of growth mindset, the key word is growth. And we all know that when you grow, it's painful. That's why we have the old adage, growing pains, right? You you don't grow without these growing pains, um, but you'll be the better for it on the other end. Now, the second mindset, of course, are the leaders who, you know, are just are a little bit delusional, right? Um, and they really don't value diversity and inclusion, but they're, they do just enough to be perceived that they value diversity and inclusion. And these leaders, they're not interested in experiencing discomfort at all um, or, you know, or the rewards. They're just really trying to escape critique, right? It's the whole optics. They're trying to make sure that from an optical perspective, they, their leadership, they and their leadership and the company look good and are perceived to be doing things. But you're very quickly found out, right? That, you know, if you, you know, you can, you can, play the song and dance, but, you know, after a while, it's going to catch up with you. And they feel, you know, at the end of the day that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a plain, it's safe. They do things as if they've always, that they do things the way they've always been done, but with just enough attention to diversity that they don't appear tone deaf, you know, for our times. But I will let you know that <laughs> this younger generation, the Gen Zers, the younger millennials, all of them, they do their research, they will find out and they will not stick around. If you play a really nice song and dance, your optics look amazing. You recruit them in there. And once they get there, if they realize that it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors, they're out. So that is why you need to pay attention because people are your biggest investment 
And you need to get return on that investment. And if you aren't thinking about going beyond the optics of diversity and truly becoming an inclusive organization and embracing that diversity of thought and that cognitive diversity, then you are going to get left behind. So remember, this work is hard and it's meaningful, but you've got to do it in order to make sure that you are reaping all of those rewards. So I hope that this idea of going beyond the optics of diversity will resonate with you and will give you food for thought and you will marinate on this and think about who do you want to be? Do you want to be that leader who is truly making change or do you want to be that leader who is just talking the talk but not walking the walk? Thanks for joining and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.